please know I am but a humble raven puff and do not own or take credit for any of the magical fan fictions on this podcasting channel. Nor do I own any rights or magical say on J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter characters that are mentioned within these stories. These fan fictions are the result of much more creative and dedicated minds than my own, and I will be introducing these authors as well as where to find their other works at the beginning of every episode. Hello, my magical brethren, and welcome to Fox's Fix, a podcast that attempts the sonorous charm on some of your favorite Harry Potter fan fictions. So whether you're taking the night bus across town, denoming your garden, or simply shopping through Diagon Alley, this is a podcast that allows even the busiest witches and wizards a chance to listen to their favorite fan fiction. So I'd say it's time we take a page out of Fox's book and light up this week's fan fiction. Fox's Fix presents the unabridged audiobook of Isolation, written by Bex Chan and narrated by Fox's Fix. Bex Chan's novel-length fanfiction can be located on fanfiction.net as well as archiveofourown.org. Warning, this fanfiction is rated mature for its explicit language, content, and themes. Chapter 10. Taste. It was nothing, barely an anything, but it was a beautiful nothing. Just a small clash of breaths, closed eyes, as Draco's upper lip fell between both of Hermione's, and his tongue ghosted across her lower lip. Just a little connection of flesh and taste that lasted all of two clicks of the clock's quickest hand, before reality and cruelty shattered it. Wild, gray eyes snapped open, and Draco lunged away, ripping his face out of Hermione's hands like he'd been scolded. Scrambling away from her with frantic movements, his chest was heaving with confusion and shock that burned his bones and pounded in his skull. He could hear her panting too, and his eyes went to the exposed skin of her stomach, as that fucking lusty twitch in his growing hit him again. Everything was slowly coming back to him. Sights, sounds, just everything beyond her. He glanced down at his hands and scowled at the empty allergy shot in his grip. He hadn't even realized he tugged it out of her as he pulled back. He chucked it away with disgust, blaming it for dragging him into this entire situation this vile and revolting situation. How could he have allowed this to happen? How could Granger have allowed this to happen? And why the hell wasn't she moving or talking? All that sliced the silence between them was their volatile and bewildered breathing. He could still taste her in his mouth, his top lip damp by her barely there suck. Realizing this, He hastily dragged the back of his arm against his mouth, wiping away her kiss several times until the friction started to burn. With a final horrified look at Granger, who was still frozen on the floor, he pulled himself up and stumbled into his room, only leaving the shrill slam of his door for her to remember him by. He would have happily sacrificed the entirety of the Malfoy fortune to put more than one fucking wall between them. But this would have to do. At least he couldn't see her now. But his tongue and his nose still buzzed with her essence and scent. And he honestly didn't know if he wanted to melt in the bliss of it or block his nostrils and tear out his own fucking tongue to be rid of her. He was vibrating with anger and mortification and he covered his face in his palms as stubborn flashes of her yielding lips and bare skin pulsed behind his eyelids. A growl rumbled at the front of his throat and teased his tonsils as he tried to shove the images back down into his brain, but they wouldn't shift. They wouldn't leave him be. Merlin, he fucking hated her. Hated himself hated every sodding detail of events that had led him to this humiliating and degrading incident in the first place. Draco knew he'd gone mad. He'd finally gone mad. Funny enough, though, he'd never felt more real, more alive. 
and she'd tasted so dangerously delicious. Fuck, he really had gone mad. Hermione flinched at the bang of Draco's door and dragged in a shaky breath. She wanted to fade away into the floorboards or beg McGonagall for a spin of the time-turner to erase this incident from existence. The worst thing was she had no idea who had initiated their little thing, their demi-kiss. Oh, God. But she couldn't help but lick her lips and savor the leftovers of his kiss. It tasted something close to citrus and masculinity with a dash of peppermint. She could feel the warm remains of his palm print against her abdomen, and she was certain she could still sense his weight leaning over her. Malfoy had returned to his healthier shape since she started cooking for him, and being that close, he'd felt safe and rather sinful. Since the night of Bill and Fleur's wedding, when her and Ron had lost their virtues to one another in a clumsy tumble, she hadn't enjoyed any male company that could be considered remotely suggestive. And honestly, all that she could really remember from that night was sweat-clumsy gropes and an awkward goodbye as Ron and Harry had disappeared to start the Horcrux hunt and she'd been left behind with one-third of her heart and too many questions to count. And before Ron, she'd only ever had some interesting kisses with Victor and some unfortunate lip locks with Cormac. Ugh. Hermione knew she wasn't the most feminine girl in Hogwarts, and she would honestly have to undergo a complete lobotomy before she was anything close to confident or a promiscuous little tart. But she still had needs and desires. She adored that pleasing sensation of an intimate proximity, and God your curse her for it, but Draco had felt like a dreamy quilt of blissful sedatives that had numbed her brain in a wonderful way. It had been instinctive and impulsive, a reminder that she still felt something other than despair. But now, well, now that it was over, she just felt like she'd betrayed everyone she held dear, including herself. For the supposed brightest witch of their age, she had just done the stupidest thing possible. Ugh, she needed to get some air. She needed to gather her thoughts. And honestly, it was probably best she head down to the infirmary to ensure her allergic reaction was completely medicated. There was a gloss of sweat across her forehead and above her upper lip as she carefully pulled herself into a sitting position, moaning as her weak limbs protested with every movement. She realized she was trembling, and she honestly didn't know if it was from her allergy attack or Draco's lips. Battling a shiver, she grabbed her wand and struggled to the door, thanking forgotten deities that her room wasn't too far from the hospital wing. Stumbling with some difficulty along the lonely corridors, she weaved around necessary corners and had a second shock of the afternoon when she found the infirmary bustling with activity. She froze in the doorway and her eyes danced across the busy room, her confused gaze immediately falling to her blonde friend, perched on one of the beds. Luna, Hermione called, dodging two third years as she neared the Ravenclaw. What's going on? Hello, Hermione. One of the herbology hives collapsed. Luna replied in her usual bored tone. A lot of people have been stung. Although I think Dennis Creevy actually has a case of apotoxin poisoning. Hermione didn't even blink at the odd comment. Is everyone okay? I think so. Luna nodded, 
gesturing to a small rash in her forearm. Madame Pomfrey's just finishing up with Laura madly, and I think I'm next. How many are after you? Those people over there, she mumbled and pointed to a crowd of no less than fifteen students. I'm guessing the bees came into the castle because of the cold. Why are you here, Hermione? Oh, I was bitten. And then kissed. Aren't you allergic to bee stings? The other witch interrupted her thought. Yes, I was just... Your lips look a little different. And your eyes are a bit glazed. The blonde commented calmly. And the Gryffindor princess felt her blood burn her cheeks. Hermione swallowed hard. It, it's just... Oh, Miss Granger! A new voice interrupted, and Hermione glanced up to find a rather flustered-looking McGonagall approaching her quickly. There you are. Mr. Longbottom said that you would be in the library, the silly boy. Have you been bitten? Are you okay? I, I think so, the brunette stuttered. I mean, yes. I was stung, but I... Right, the headmistress interrupted, motioning for Hermione to follow her. Come on, I'll double-check you now. Can't be too careful with your allergy. I'll come find you after, Luna, Hermione whispered to her friend as she trailed behind the older witch. Professor, I need to talk to you. Sit on the bed, Miss Granger, McGonagall bade, pulling the curtain to seclude them. Now, where were you bitten? Oh, here, Hermione replied, showing the other witch the swollen skin between her knuckles and wrist. But I... And you managed to give yourself the allergy shot in time? McGonagall interrupted once more. No, I... I'll have to get Poppy to... Professor! Hermione whispered sternly, keeping her voice as low as possible. Professor, I didn't give myself the allergy shot. Draco gave me the shot. The headmistress's eyebrows rose high into her wrinkled lace forehead, and Hermione heard her murmur a quick silencing charm before she turned back to her. Mr. Malfoy? She clarified skeptically. Are you certain? Yes, Hermione sighed, shifting her weight with discomfort. He... he helped me. McGonagall's eyebrows went a little higher then. Well, McGonagall breathed, I must say, I'm rather surprised. Maybe, maybe this is a good sign, Hermione said with rushed but uncertain optimism. Maybe I'm getting through to him. Miss Granger, McGonagall interrupted with a small frown. I warned you not to get your hopes up concerning this, this little project of yours. I know, but I... It's possible that Mr. Malfoy just didn't want to be blamed for anything that happened to you, McGonagall continued with thick reasoning, and the younger witch's face scrunched up with doubt. Nevertheless, at least you are well. Just let me check your hand. Hermione absently did as requested, her thoughts stealing her away as McGonagall inspected the bite. Hermione could remember little about her anaphylactic shock. Between the fluttering levels of consciousness and the panic that had throbbed in her head, she couldn't exactly remember how Malfoy had found her or any specifics of him injecting her. All that had battered her brain was him and what had happened afterwards. Godric, Godric, Godric. Have I really been this starved for company? Hermione would admit that her desire to alter and erase Draco's prejudices had become somewhat of an obsession lately. But Dumbledore himself had seen something in Draco that was redeemable. And now, she saw it too. Her loneliness didn't exactly help their predicament, and she did have a feeling that it contributed to her fascination with the small changes she'd noticed in him recently. Those changes were only minuscule, but she was fixated on them. Fixated on him. She couldn't help it. She couldn't help that she started to kiss him back. 
she'd allowed herself to get steered by the breathtaking situation. But it would never happen again. Ever. She was still determined to break his brainwashed mindset, but she needed to keep her own brain in check and remember herself. Malfoy was still just Malfoy, and she had to maintain a sensible distance with him, even if his lips felt like, like water-damped feathers. She would have never guessed he would feel so soft. Hermione blinked several times when she realized McGonagall's mouth was moving in front of her. What? She stuttered, giving her professor an apologetic look. I'm sorry, professor. I didn't quite hear you. I said that despite Mr. Malfoy's questionable reasons for helping you, the headmistress spoke, concentrating on the younger witch's wounded hand. I hoped you thanked him appropriately. Hermione could barely manage a slow nod as she averted her eyes, silently deciding that her gratitude towards the spiteful Slytherin had been far from appropriate. Yes, Professor. Well, I do have some news that might cheer you up. McGonagall offered her a rare grin. I received a letter from Nymphadora. Tonks? Hermione asked, her head snapping up with interest. Is she okay? She's fine as far as I know, the professor assured. She's coming to visit for a couple of days to discuss some safety measures for Hogwarts. Will I see her? Please let me see her, Professor. Calm down, Hermione, McGonagall sighed. She wants to keep her head down, so she's staying at the three broomsticks, and I'm happy to give you permission to stay with her for a couple of nights. Oh, thank you, Professor, Hermione smiled, relieved for some distraction in her otherwise troublesome day. When is she coming? She'll be arriving next Thursday and she'll be leaving on Saturday, McGonagall explained, finishing up with Hermione's hand. I expect you to attend all of your classes, but I doubt you would have missed them anyways. Of course not, Professor. Then I have no issue with you visiting, the headmistress said, and I think it might do you some good to see her. You are looking a lot more troubled recently. Wait, the younger witch frowned as Draco slipped back into her head. What about Malfoy? What about him? McGonagall replied calmly. You said yourself he spends most of his time in his room. If anything, I'm sure he will be pleased to have some time on his own, and I would recommend you make the most of this little break from him. I know that you must find living with him quite difficult. You have no idea, Professor. And as of today, it just got that much more difficult. I guess, the brunette whispered aloud, realizing she had yet another secret, and this one was possibly the worst. Are we still going to Hogsmeade this weekend? Of course, McGonagall nodded. I imagine many of your friends have asked you to bring some things back for them. I only asked Malfoy. No, Hermione murmured, sealing her eyes to hide her guilt. Just the one. Don't you think it's sad? Hermione arched an eyebrow at her bright-haired companion. Do I think what's sad, Luna? That all those bees are going to die, Luna said quietly, adjusting herself in the library chair. Twenty-two people were bitten, so that's at least twenty-two bees. Hermione offered her friend a weak but affectionate smile and privately thanked the pretty blonde for providing her with some level of distraction. The library was cold and empty save for two fifth years stashed away in the other corner, and the winter evening was just starting to cast a navy darkness into the musky space. Surrounded by enchanting books, and in Luna's innocent presence, 
Hermione found her tempestuous thoughts about Malfoy had calmed a little, although she knew it was only temporary. Don't worry, Luna, it's just a myth, Hermione told her warmly. Only honeybees die after they sting, and Hogwarts only carries bumblebees. Oh, that's good news, Luna mumbled, raising her head and trailing her lazy eyes over the other girl's features. Your lips still look a little different, Hermione. No, they don't, the hazel-eyed witch defended. They're fine. But your hand is all healed, Luna continued absently. Perhaps you reacted to something a little stronger. See, that was the thing with Ravenclaw's angelic sweetheart. While her tone remained consistently bland, she would often mutter a seemingly innocent comment that would either leave you feeling enlightened or paranoid. And in this case, it was definitely the latter. I can't think of anything, Hermione replied stiffly. Does it matter? Only if it's bothering you, Luna shrugged, turning the page of her book. Would you like to stay in the Ravenclaw Tower tonight? I know you don't like to be alone when it's windy. It was a tempting offer. Hermione had been purposely putting off returning to her dorm. To him. And here was the perfect opportunity to prolong that separation. This was where her Gryffindor courage became an impediment, stubbornly telling her that avoiding her own home was a cowardly option. Her common sense also jumped in and reminded her that she would have to confront the situation eventually, and the longer she avoided it, the more she would lose face. No, it's okay, Hermione sighed reluctantly. I find it difficult to sleep in another bed anyway. Okay, Luna agreed blankly, slowly packing up her belongings. Well, if you change your mind, I'm sure you'd be able to crack the riddle. Thanks, Luna. Do you want me to walk you back? I prefer the walk alone, she replied, rising from her seat and giving the Gryffindor a long look. I don't know what's made your lips look different, but it suits you. The older witch couldn't stifle the flinch. You're imagining it, Hermione replied with a forced nonchalance, unable to feel a sliver of impatience towards the girl as she turned to leave. That paranoia was back, though. Good night, Luna. Good night, Hermione, she replied over her shoulder as she disappeared among the aisles. Hermione pursed her lips and would swear that she tongued a whisper of Malfoy's fruity taste as she did so. Dear Merlin, this was hard. That barely nothing incident had turned her into a fumbling fool with dangerous thoughts that were too quick and wild to really grasp. The worst thing was, she had no idea if she would choose to eradicate it from her memory or if all the confusion was worth the pleasant tingle inside her mouth. Had it even really counted as a kiss? Oh, sought it, she whispered to herself, gathering her things and a couple of extra texts on dark magic and horcruxes, before she left the library. The November winds would almost certainly discard her to sleep on the sofa again, and she highly doubted that Malfoy would be joining her this time. And honestly, she wasn't sure how she felt about that. While she was quite content to have as much distance from him as possible right now, the two nights that she'd slept near Draco had been the longest and most relaxing rest she'd had since Harry and Ron left. She told herself it was simply because his company provided some level of security. But truth be told, there was something hypnotic about his breaths in the night. She paused as she came face to face with her room, realizing she was shaking slightly and her heart was rattling loudly inside her ribcage. She inhaled until it started to burn and released the air as slowly as possible, nervously flicking her fingernails and practically eating her bottom lip. Godric, give me strength, 
she mumbled, offering the curious lions her password, Adelusum. With vibrating fingers and a lost heartbeat, she pushed open the door and found the room painted in darkness. Scanning the jumble of shadows warily and finding only familiar shapes and outlines, she made her way to the small kitchenette and concluded a hot chocolate would ease some of her nerves. Assuming Malfoy was in his room and would be there for the remainder of the night, she rolled her shoulders and allowed herself to finally relax. Silently igniting some of the candles, just to create a nice pre-slumber glow as she fixed herself a steaming drink. The witch was completely oblivious to the pair of serpentine eyes watching her every movement. Draco observed her from the couch, missing the darkness that had shielded him before Granger had brought a little light into the room. Typical. She hadn't even noticed him. Which was odd, because he would swear she looked straight at him when she shuffled past the door. But then, maybe it had been a little darker than he thought. Ensuring his breaths were quiet and steady, Draco openly stared at Granger's back, staring at her jumbled mass of curls and sliding down to her spine to end at the feminine flare of her hips just visible under her robes. He intended to disturb her any moment now, perhaps scare her and threaten her for his own amusement, and to prove that his earlier slip-up meant nothing. That had been the plan, but yet again, as a distant mist glossed his gaze, and as he studied the frustrating witch in front of him, it simmered. She tilted her head and gave the nape of her neck a slow rub before she slipped off her robes and tossed them onto the counter. He couldn't help but focus on the barely visible bra straps beneath her white shirt, and he was just able to make out that they were light blue, simple and serene, typical Granger, but that spasm between his hips twitched again anyway. He left his seat on the couch carefully, slinking around the furniture and shadows with inaudible footsteps as he edged a little closer to her. Perhaps, if he could get near her, he could inhale enough of her scent to imitate her taste from earlier. Ugh, catching himself and that dangerous thought from continuing, he reminded himself how repulsive she was with her inferior blood. An image of that muggle book she insisted he read flashed across his lids, but he shoved it away and planted a scornful sneer on his face, just to reflect how much he really despised her. And he did. Honestly, he did. He despised her, and she needed to know that. Slipping into the kitchenette, he was now close enough that he could touch her and the innocent little witch was still oblivious until he scuffed his foot against the floor. Hermione spun around so fast she knocked her mug to the side and sent it smashing and pouring to the floor with a loud crunch. Her hair was whipped across her face, caught between parted and damp lips, as her eyes blazed with stormy surprise. She was panting frantically as she stumbled back, and his hand darted out to grab her wrist. Draco, she gasped, trying to pull away and shield her face. What are you? But she was cut off as he grabbed her other hand and placed them both sternly at her sides, backing her up until she was trapped between the counter and him. She felt panic bubble in her chest, not because she thought he would hurt her. No, because he was just too close. Her alarmed breathing was sucking in his drugging masculine smell, and she felt her body swimming with heat as their proximity ached beneath her skin. She watched with wide eyes as he seemed to falter and pull away a little, swaying on his feet with small but seductive movements. The air was wedged in her throat as he towered over her, 
with his features set in a tense scowl and a growl humming in his windpipe. I want to get some things straight, Draco snapped bluntly, and she jumped at his voice. I didn't help you because I give a shit about your life. I shut up, he hissed cruelly, gripping her wrists a little tighter. I am deadly serious, Granger. I know how your pathetic little head works, and I am telling you, here and now, it didn't mean a bloody thing. Then why did you help me? Hermione asked as effortlessly as she could, schooling her expression into a controlled mask. Why even bother? Because I bloody had to, he shouted. If you had died, then I would... You would have been blamed. She finished for him in a disappointed tone. Except you wouldn't. You have no magic, Malfoy. Do you honestly believe they would have pinned a bee sting on you? I think you and your precious order would do anything to get rid of me. Well, you're wrong, Hermione bit back quickly. They wouldn't. I don't care, he spat, dipping his head a little closer. I'm telling you here and now that I don't give a flying fuck if you live or die. His comment shouldn't have hurt her, but it did. She felt something in her chest shrink and shrivel like burning parchment, but she did everything she could not to let it show. You helped me, and I helped you, Draco continued crisply. We're even, so let's just leave it at that and return to hating each other. Then we're back to where we started, Hermione sighed, hating the edge of sadness to her whisper. Draco blinked at her odd comment as a heavy and humid silence settled between them. Her little puffs of air were brushing across the skin of his face, and it was taking every stitch of his self-control not to glance down at her mouth. She felt so charmingly vulnerable and petite against his tall frame, but he blamed it yet again on this claustrophobic hell and the remains of her blood still waltzing through his veins. He could feel that incessant and unwelcome hunger for a lick of her beginning to cloud his sanity again. He needed to sever this discussion with her. Now. He needed to get away from her. We're done here, Draco snarled, releasing her wrists and striding towards his room. And as I said, Granger, don't let that overworked brain of yours read too much into it. Hermione felt the cold wrap around her quickly as he headed away from her, and something nagged in her head as she watched the fine muscles across his shoulders flex. She wasn't satisfied with the way he had ended their discussion, and that Gryffindor bravery, combined with her own curiosity, was a dangerous mixture at times like these. And what about what happened after you helped me? She knew her voice had wavered, but she didn't care, as he stalled abruptly before reaching his door. The air in the room instantly grew thicker and uneasy, and her fawny eyes were glued to him as he slowly turned to shoot her a fierce glare that took her breath away. Looking somewhere between incensed and disturbed, She found herself yet again noting his aristocratic and infuriatingly striking features. He really was so... Nothing happened, Draco growled slowly, taking steps back towards her and pointing a rage-trembling finger at her. Do you hear me, Granger? Nothing fucking happened. Then I must be remembering things differently. She fired back, lifting her chin defiantly, because as I recall, shut the hell up, that you and I don't, Draco barked. Nothing happened, and nothing ever will happen, so you just shut your filthy mud- mud blood mouth, she finished evenly, tilting her head boldly to the side and folding her arms over her chest. I know I've struck a nerve with your prejudices against muggles, Malfoy, so you can use that silly little word all you'd like, 
because I know you are starting to doubt yourself. You are so bloody stupid, he countered, but there was a hint of hesitation there that he hoped she couldn't hear. Close enough now, his senses were once again overpowered by her. I loathe you and your kind. You and your mud-blood mouth have only proved to me how vile you all are. Well, you kissed this mud-blood mouth. No, I fucking didn't. The flushed and agitated pair froze when their noses brushed softly, gold and silver eyes going round and confused as they did so. Hermione didn't dare move as his delectable little breaths fell into her mouth again and that warm throb in her chest returned. Draco looked horrified and perhaps a little fearful as the silence stretched around them and he did everything he could to smother that almost instinctive urge to steal another taste of her. But he closed his eyes anyways. Yes, he had definitely gone mad. Praise Salazar for the little spark in his brain that jolted him back to reality and reminded him who and what she was. Mudblood. 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 He ripped himself too quickly away from her and stumbled on clumsy feet shooting her a look of pure contempt and bewilderment as his head spun. Granger looked a little too inviting then, mouth slightly parted, and a rosy blush staining her cheeks and the skin across her collarbone. She looked too human, too normal. Fuck, he needed to get to his room. Nothing happened he repeated between the panicked heaves of his chest. You understand, Granger? And if you ever need help again, I swear to you on my name as a Malfoy that I will watch you suffer and enjoy every second of it. His dark and steady words stabbed her like ice-cold darts. Draco, I... Just stay the fuck away from me he threatened in a low whisper, returning back towards his room. And with yet another slam of his door, Hermione was left alone, guiltily wondering if she'd had let him kiss her again. On the other side of the door, Draco sank to his knees and cradled his aching head in his palms, cursing her to Merlin's grave and back for reducing him to this pathetic excuse for a wizard. With no magic and his sanity in a fragile state, he determined that this was the lowest point in his life. And the worst thing was, only she seemed to ease the tempest in his brain. With that disconcerting notion misting his mind and another migraine coming along shortly, he would have surrendered the flimsy crumbs of his pride for just another taste of her, if only to chase away the demons that would make sleep possible again. What the fuck was she doing to me? And why did he have this feeling that things would only get worse from here? This has been an unabridged audio chapter of Isolation, written by Bex Chan and narrated by Fox's Fix. A special thank you goes out to Bex Chan for allowing me the privilege to read her story. To recommend your favorite Harry Potter fanfiction for future audiobook episodes, please visit Fox Fix Facebook page and Instagram through the links located in our description below. You can also help support us with donations through our PayPal account to help produce and shape in our future narrated fanfictions. Thank you for listening. Please join us next week for a continuation of this magical fanfiction. See you then!